All right, so welcome to the class again. Today we will start. Um, uh, I made a new section in my notebook. As you see, the the, the new section is Fourier transform. It's not the Fourier series. Uh, the one just above it was Fourier series, and now we are going to do Fourier transform. So, what is the difference between a Fourier uh, transform and the Fourier series representation? Um, you have to be careful that the Fourier series representation was valid for periodic signals. So, a periodic uh, if the signal is not periodic, there is no periodicity of the signal. And in general, the signals may be just finite or start from a point and uh, extend, etc. Um, so uh, the more general way of uh, uh, dealing with the frequency content of a signal is essentially the Fourier transform. So let us see what it is. The Fourier transform. We may start by um, generalizing the concept of Fourier series and uh, the evaluation of uh, Fourier series coefficients to uh, a periodic signal or extending the period to infinity. That is a methodology to discover the formula for um, the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform, of course. Uh, let's do that uh, to understand, to have a better understanding about the formulation and its relation to the Fourier series. We know, first of all, that uh, in the Fourier series, uh, we had the representation of a periodic signal. In order to indicate that it's periodic, let me put a tilde on it. So X tilde of T is a periodic signal uh, with the fundamental frequency being omega zero or fundamental period being capital T, which is two pi over omega zero. So this was the representation that we have, a k e to the j k times omega zero. So an integer uh, multiple of omega zero will be the harmonic uh, frequency. And a k is the Fourier series coefficient here, where we also had a formula to determine uh, the value of a k. It was uh, one over capital T, capital T being the period, integral from, let's say, minus capital T over two to capital T over two, but this is not necessary. Any uh, duration, integration duration of capital T is valid here. The periodic signal X of X tilde of T e to the negative J K omega zero T DT. So this is the uh, formula for uh, the Fourier series coefficient. We will start with the Fourier series coefficient itself. And uh, I will try to uh, illustrate or start from here and uh, notate a new um, variable here, which is capital T times AK. Okay, it's not AK, but capital T times AK. Because as you see, as capital T goes to infinity, okay, um, and suppose that it's a rectangular box shape or something like that in, in the center of a period or any kind of a shape, finite uh, duration shape. And it is repeating itself, but the repetition uh, position goes to infinity. If you think of it like that, as capital T goes to infinity, these AKs that we have will be uh, smaller and smaller, and they will shrink down to zero in value as t goes to infinity. So a k is zero and t is going to infinity. What is capital T times a k? That is uh, the new representation and we are going to call it the Fourier transform. We will convert it to the Fourier transform and it's, it's not going to be notated in terms of k. It will be notated in terms of the frequency variable which is omega. Uh, we will do it that way. And um, when I write it like this, it will be from minus t over two to t over two. Um, I will write x of t because within the uh, period, within one period, actually x tilde of t is the periodically extended version and x of t is the one isolated signal 
whose Fourier transform we are looking for. So within this integration limit, x tilde of t is the same as x of t. And e to the minus j k omega 0 t dt, I'm still writing them to be the same. And I'm going to say that this thing, k times omega 0, is the frequency of the uh, harmonic, and therefore it is the frequency, omega. Okay, k times omega 0 is omega. As capital T goes to infinity, we will do that. Uh, omega 0 is 2 pi over capital T, so it goes to 0 too. So omega 0 will be arbitrarily small, smaller and smaller, shrinking down to 0. And k is uh, an index ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity. So that k times omega 0 will correspond to something like a continuous variation of a uh, frequency. Since omega 0 is very small, k times omega 0 will be almost continuously varying. And as capital T goes to infinity, k times omega 0 will be really continuously varying, and we are going to call it uh, omega like this. So as limit as t goes to infinity, capital T times a k uh, will be from minus infinity to plus infinity, because as capital T goes to infinity, minus capital T over 2 will also be minus infinity, and T over 2 will be plus infinity. And I will have X of T, and E to the minus J times omega times T, because K times omega 0, I said to be omega dt. And I'm going to uh, call it X of J omega which is the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform is obtained by uh, extending the period, the repetition period, to go to infinity, which is practically making the signal aperiodic, okay? A normal, regular signal, not necessarily periodic. This would therefore be the um, Fourier transform formula. Now you may want to check your notes and go back several pages to remember something, which was uh, when x of t goes into a, a filter, let's call it h, this was y of t, and we were notating h of t using um, in the frequency domain, or, or using the frequency domain, when we said that we can also write it like h of omega which is actually a spectral uh, formulation of uh, H. And each um, harmonic of X of T of the input uh, will be multiplied by H of omega to produce the harmonic of the output Y of T. You may remember that. And the H of T formula I also gave to you to be equal to this. And over there, I briefly mentioned that this is actually the Fourier transform of H of T. And now from uh, the formula that you see in the box, as you see, they have the same formulas. This is the Fourier transform of H of T. So any time signal, it, it can be X of T, H of T, Y of T, G of T, F of T. All of them can be put into this formula and the result will be capitalized version of it. That's the notation that we are going to use in the Oppenheim's book. Uh, capital X of omega. That will be uh, the Fourier transform with the same formula. Always this one we are going to use. And in this formula, you may notice that uh, we are using a term called um, J inside omega. Why are we doing that? Because actually this is... This capital X is a function of omega. It's not a function of J omega. <laughs> Why would we do that? That's right. Uh, it, it is actually X of omega. And in many of the books, it is quite simply notated as capital X of omega, not a capital X of J omega. Unfortunately, in Oppenheim's book, it prefers the usage of J omega because of a reason. Because, uh, because of indicating the fact that 
the frequency in the complex exponent is an uh, imaginary term always appearing with a j there's always an e to the j omega sort of thing so uh, j and omega uh, come together all the time and uh, in the future in the laplace transform concept that we will see within days uh, it's going to be like uh, inside capital x parentheses you can also put a real part okay it could be let's say sigma plus j omega and that real component and imaginary component will be combined to be represented with a new uh, component that you may remember from uh, differential equation courses which we used as s okay that s is equal to sigma plus j omega a real part and an imaginary part and to emphasize the fact that omega is the imaginary part we are going to use uh, this kind of annotation capital x of j omega so don't pl please try not to write the fourier transform as ca capital x of omega only please say capital x of j omega to clearly indicate that this is the continuous time fourier transform of a continuous time signal x of t so this is the Fourier transform. And then what is the inverse Fourier transform then? The inverse transform can also be derived very easily as uh, this. And, and I'm going to start from the periodic extended version again, x tilde of t. We know that that is equal to k from minus infinity to infinity, uh, a k. I will write it like this. And I will put a k because I'm going to erase it. And e to the uh, j k omega zero t. Okay, this was the notation that we were using. Now I will replace this a k by one over capital T um, capital X of j k omega zero. Why k omega zero? Because I'm going to write everything in terms of k. Uh, normally, it, it should be capital X of j omega, j omega, sorry, capital X of j omega. But uh, omega is equal to k omega zero, and I'm going to write everything first in terms of uh, k. So I'm replacing this by one over capital T times capital X j k omega zero. Now, I'm also going to uh, notice that this k times omega zero could be recalled as omega. And this could be written as one over capital T times uh, capital X of j omega as well. So now, using uh, a different color, let me try to uh, write a an alternative way of these things. Um, we have one over capital T, okay, in the summation, and the summation k from minus infinity to infinity, um, capital X of uh, jk omega zero. Still, I'm going to write it like this, and e to the j k omega zero this is uh, the next format and then i'm going to write it in again another different color uh, it was too thin so let me do it like this um, instead of um, one over capital t i'm going to write it as one over two pi over uh, omega zero which is omega zero over two pi okay so one over capital t is omega zero over two pi and i'm going to put the one over two pi here okay and then the summation k from minus infinity to infinity capital x j k omega zero is here e to the j k omega zero is here and omega zero is dangling here uh, at, at the last step. So overall, you notice that there is omega zero over two pi within the uh, expression.
but I put the one over two pi in the uh, beginning, and at the end I write omega zero. Now, uh, the thing that we are going to do as uh, limit capital T goes to infinity, uh, k times omega zero becomes omega. This is something that we previously used. And similarly, as t goes to infinity, omega zero itself becomes arbitrarily small, the differential of omega. So that becomes d omega. And similarly, as t goes to infinity, the summation becomes an integral. So this thing will become 1 over 2 pi integral um, at infinite interval, capital X of j omega, because k omega 0 is omega. e to the k omega 0 is again omega, so it makes e to the j omega. And omega 0 is d omega. And this is x of t, which is the inverse Fourier transform that will convert capital X of j omega into x of t. So we had two uh, formulas. One of them is the one with the, in, inside the black box that you see over there. That is x of j omega, the formula of the Fourier transform. And let me make it smaller <laughs> so that we can see both of them. The one in, in the black box at the top is the Fourier transform. The one in the red box uh, at the bottom is the inverse Fourier transform. And when you uh, compare the two equations, they are pretty much similar. There is the function itself multiplied by e to the minus j omega t or e to the plus j omega t and integrated. One of them is integrated over t to produce something in, in terms of uh, frequency. Uh, uh, Bayezid Ushik asks which one was the inverse. The forward, the Fourier transform is this. And this one is the inverse Fourier transform. It's inverse because it gives you the time signal. From the Fourier transform, you uh, come back to the time signal. That's the inverse Fourier transform. And uh, the, uh, by the way, I have forgotten to put T here, excuse me, in the uh, inverse Fourier transform formula. There is E to the J omega T. I forgot to write T. So in the inverse transform, it is E to the J omega T the multiplication term. The multiplication term in the Fourier transform is e to the minus j omega t. So they look like um, uh, conjugates of one another and the formulas are very similar. In the inverse Fourier transform there is a further scaling factor of 1 over 2 pi. Okay, As opposed to the Fourier transform where there is no 1 over 2 pi or 2 pi multiplication. It's there. But uh, it's very uh, easy to memorize and keep in mind, okay? It's not, they, these are not very complicated formulas for uh, determining the Fourier transform and for determining the inverse Fourier transform, okay? So these are the formulas. Now let me open a new page and write down uh, these formulas again x of j omega, which is the Fourier transform, is equal to integral from minus infinity to infinity x of t with a to multiply with a negative exp, uh, complex exponential e to the minus j omega t dt. This is the Fourier transform. And the inverse Fourier transform is x of t is equal to 1 over 2 pi integral x of j omega e to the positive j omega t d omega. Okay, these two are the Fourier transform pairs that 
we are going to use for uh, determining uh, the Fourier transform. Why do we determine the Fourier transform? To see the uh, signal along the frequency axis. Uh, X of t is along the time axis, so it shows the time variation, but the frequency axis, as we know, is also very valuable because it shows us uh, the, the content of the signal at each particular frequency. It may help us to analyze the signal in terms of uh, the frequency content. We call it spectrum. So uh, it's a spectrum domain, it's a spectral domain uh, that the Fourier transform gives. And uh, also, uh, it will help us to manipulate some linear and time invariant system operations uh, a little bit easier as opposed to time domain. Because we know, for example, that if X of t is input to an LTI system, linear and time invariant system, whose impulse response is H of t, what was the output Y of t? It is the convolution of X of t and H of t. And convolution is an operation. And uh, from the uh, examination, I remember that many of you guys are uh, having difficulties even in uh, doing that operation, that convolution operation. It's not very complicated, but it's still an operation. However, if you consider uh, two signals in spectral domain, like if you take the Fourier transform of X of T and say it X of J omega, and then take the Fourier transform of the impulse response, H of t, and call it capital H of j omega. The output Fourier transform, let's call it y of j, capital Y of j omega, is equal to x j omega times h j omega. It's just multiplication, no convolution or anything in the spectral domain. That's a, a, a big plus for uh, implementation of. Uh, systems, linear and time invariant systems. And it also gives us a lot of idea about what is a low pass filter, what is a high pass filter, etc. Because a low pass filter, H of j omega, as we know, will be a rectangular box shape around uh, zero frequency uh, from minus a cutoff frequency to a plus cutoff frequency, and in between it is flat. And it is zero afterwards. That will be called a low pass filter. From H of t, it's difficult to see whether it's a low pass filter or not, but when you take the Fourier transform of H of t and plot it uh, on, a, on a figure, you will immediately realize that, well, I see that it's a low pass filter or it's a band pass filter, a high pass filter, etc. So spectral analysis is a helpful tool for analyzing the signal, low pass signal, band pass signal, high pass signal, and uh, linear and time invariant systems, a low pass filter, high pass filter, band pass filter, etc. So it's a good tool. It's a very versatile tool. And people have been using Fourier analysis for analyzing signals and systems all the time. We will start with some easy but important
I hope I'm back. Uh, well, this is unfortunately happening right now. Uh, two more people from my house is also on Zoom uh, and the internet is sometimes kicking out arbitrarily. So I hope uh, you are with me now. Can you hear me now? Okay, that's good. So we, we were starting uh, with, a, uh, with an example. X of t is equal to e to the minus a t u of t. And let's assume that a is positive so that it will be starting at zero and becoming a decaying exponential. Clearly, it's not a periodic signal. And its Fourier transform really exists. The existence of the Fourier transform uh, is valid as long as uh, the integral at the top of uh, these two, uh, the, the top equation in the box converges, as long as it converges. If that integral is converging, then it means the Fourier transform exists. For instance, if the uh, values of x uh, are extending to infinity, of course, the Fourier uh, transform integral will not converge. Uh, or um, if there are infinitely many variations, then the in integral will not converge either. So there are Dirichlet conditions, as we have mentioned for periodic signals, similar conditions exist for this uh, as well. They are also known as Dirichlet conditions. The, the signal must be finite. It must have finitely many oscillations within a region, um, et cetera. And finitely many discontinuities must exist. So e to the minus a t times u of t uh, is a decaying exponential. For a greater than zero, it's going to look like this. At zero, it goes up to uh, one, and then it decays. So this is x of t in terms of the shape. And then what is the Fourier transform? Let's write the formula. Capital x of j omega is equal to, from minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus a t times u of t, which is x of t, times e to the uh, minus j omega t dt. This is the Fourier transform for in, in terms of the formula. So now, now let's evaluate it. First of all, there's a u of t inside x of t, which makes, as you see, everything uh, at the negative time, uh, t less than zero, to become zero. So the integral essentially starts from zero. Before that, x of t was already zero, and it goes all the way up to infinity. And within this range, it is e to the minus a t. We don't have to write u of t now, because I, we have indicated, incorporated it into uh, the integral limits. And e to the minus j omega t dt. OK, let's continue from zero to infinity. Now there are two exponentials in the multiplicative form, so I can combine the exponents. I can say e to the, in minus parentheses, a plus j omega t dt. I can write it like this, all right? And this thing is uh, an integral uh, which can be considered as Let's call, give this uh, a name. Let's say that it's S, okay, a parameter, a suitable parameter, by the way. And we know that integral from zero to infinity, uh, e to the, or within any range, as a matter of fact, e to the minus st dt is equal to minus one over s e to the minus st from infinity to zero, or uh, be between zero and infinity. That's how we uh, take the uh, deterministic proper integral. Uh, so from here, using this calculus knowledge, I can write this thing to be equal to minus one over a plus j omega, that is minus one over s, uh, e to the minus a plus j omega t, and it starts uh, at infinity, 
and ends at zero. So at infinity, uh, I will evaluate this. At t is equal to infinity, I will evaluate this. And I will subtract from that the value at zero. Okay. Now, what is this at t is equal to infinity? Just insert t is equal to infinity, and then I will insert t is equal to zero as well. Can you tell me the value of this function, minus 1 over a plus j omega, e to the minus a plus j omega t, at t is equal to infinity? Zero? You may have, yeah, exactly. It is, it is zero. Because e to the minus a is positive, minus a times t is going to zero. Uh, and that j omega is nothing. It's just a complex uh, oscillatory factor. And you can think of it, it as e to the minus a t times e to the minus j omega t. e to the minus j omega t is oscillating between plus and minus one. Okay, it's rotating on a unit circle. So its magnitude is bounded. But e to the minus a t shrinks down to zero in the multiplication format. Therefore, we have nothing at infinity. It is zero. Minus. What is the value at zero is the thing that we have to evaluate. Let's put t is equal to zero. It makes e to the minus zero or e to the zero. And uh, as Bayes uh, indicated, that means one. e to the minus uh, a plus j omega t at t is equal to zero is one. But there is also a scale. Minus one over a plus j omega is Okay, it's coming back, I hope. Internet today, as usual, is bad. Okay, so it is uh, zero minus uh, negative one over a plus j omega times one, and that is equal to one over a plus j omega. And that is equal to x of j omega. So if I ever ask you to find the Fourier transform of the signal, you have to give me this answer. This is the Fourier transform of it. So you may, uh, I said in the beginning that uh, this is good for analyzing signals in. Uh, in frequency domain, it may give us an idea about what, whether it's a low pass signal, a high pass signal, a band pass signal, etc. So what does this really look like? Let's uh, think about it a little bit. The thing that uh, indicates whether it's low pass or high pass or whatever is not x of j omega itself, because we cannot plot it. You cannot really, uh, 1 over a plus j omega. Uh, you cannot draw this, but you can draw two things with it. One of them is the magnitude. The other one is the angle of x of j omega. These are the uh, two... Uh, real-valued components, which in total describes the, uh, the complex value. Of course, the uh, bandpass, uh, low-pass, high-pass, etc., is more related to the magnitude plot. So let's take a look at the magnitude plot. What is capital X of J omega in magnitude, or uh, in absolute value? That is... How can you uh, find it? Um, you can find it by multiplying this term, 1 over a plus j omega, with the conjugate of it. You, can, you have to first multiply uh, the co uh, complex now, uh, number or complex expression with its conjugate, and then take the square root of it. 
that will uh, give you a real value uh, signal and over here it will correspond to this for this example this is the magnitude <coughs> one over square root of a square plus omega square and now let's try to plot it Uh, on the frequency axis, I am trying to plot x of j omega. <coughs> it's a function of it's a function of omega. Uh, you may try to find a few points corresponding to this one. For example, when omega is equal to zero, uh, what is the value of magnitude of x of j omega? Just put omega is equal to zero inside it, and it will become one over square root of a squared, which is one over a, because we know that a is positive. So one over a is the is the peak value. It's the largest value uh, that uh, this thing attains because omega is in the denominator. Therefore, as omega increases positively or negatively, because we are taking the square of it in the denominator. Uh, the denominator will increase, therefore the, uh, the, the value will decrease. For instance, when omega becomes a, let's say a is here, and omega is equal to a, this, uh, the denominator will become square root of a squared plus a squared, which is um, 2a squared in the square root, in the denominator. And that would actually mean... Um, something like this the value here i will indicate its numerical value and it's shrinking down to zero to the tails like this and this value is um i cannot write it inside so let me do it like this one over a times <clears throat> one over square root of two <coughs> because it will be uh, one over square root of two times the uh, original value here at a and at minus a two and the values will decrease even further you may remember from uh, circuit theory or electronic circuits and things like that that if uh, the value reaches to one over square root of two times uh, the, uh, the peak value, that is the minus three decibels point, minus three dB point, which is usually considered to be the bandwidth of a filter. So this is a, actually a filter. It's a low-pass filter. And the bandwidth of this low-pass filter seems to be A. Okay? And after A, uh, it attenuates uh, too much. It shrinks too much, so out of band. But uh, when you consider it in more detail using signals and systems, when you look at this figure by itself without the body plots and things like that, body plots are very rough approximations of these precise and actual uh, plots of, of, of the signal in spectrum domain under uh, along the omega axis. Uh, but that is the minus 3 dB point, just to make an analogy between circuits and signals and systems. So this signal is a low-pass signal. So e to the uh, minus a t times u of t is a low-pass signal. We can say it's not a perfect ideal low-pass uh, signal because it's fully transformed does not abruptly end at some point, but it decays in energy. And we call such signals as low-pass signals too. Uh, I have indicated that there is also uh, an angle term. Angles are uh, unimportant for some signal types. So uh, usually people are not very much interested in the, the angle. It's, it's the I to, uh, symbol that I'm trying to uh, write over there the angle of x of j omega, because, for instance, in audio signals, that phase, that angle, uh, does not uh, correspond to anything. We cannot hear the angular difference or the phase difference of signals. 
So if it is audio signal processing, then you're not interested in these angles. But you may have another application where this angle is important. So let's also see, uh, uh, learn how to find uh, the angle. Uh, There's a shortcut of complex numbers uh, angle. The angle is the inverse tangent or arc tangent of um, the imaginary part divided by the real part. Okay, imaginary over the real part is, so if this is imaginary, if this is the real, and if this is your uh, value or expression, uh, this length, actually I draw it uh, on an incorrect uh, order. Let's draw, uh, it's like the horizontal is the real, and the vertical is the imaginary axis. This makes more sense, sorry about that. And this is your uh, complex expression. The real part is here, and the imaginary part is this much. So you divide them to one another and take the arc tangent, which will give you uh, this angle. Let's call it alpha. This alpha angle is <clears throat> determined like this. In, um, uh, in practice. So uh, I, I can also uh, do it that way. But <clears throat> notice that the complex term is in the denominator. There may be multiple complex terms, by the way. So what are we going to do in those cases? We will see some examples of that. But if it is in the denominator, then uh, the angle is the negative of it, like the negative of arc tangent of a real part over, uh, sorry, imaginary part over the real part. First of all, what is the uh, expression? Let's write the expression again. X of j omega was one over a plus j omega. So what is the imaginary value? Imaginary is omega. Real value is a. Okay. Um, but it's in the denominator. So the angle is negative of r tangent of omega over a. If, uh, for example, x of j omega is a plus j omega, not 1 over a plus j omega, then it would be plus our tangent of omega over uh, a. You can think of it like that. Or uh, you can just uh, multiply with the conjugate and say that it's in the numerator now. And from that numerator, the angle is uh, the arc tangent of imaginary part over the real part. You can also... Uh, it like that. When omega is equal to zero, our tangent is zero. So this is the omega axis. Uh, the, the function passes through the origin. And as omega goes to infinity, uh, minus our tangent of infinity is mm, minus pi over two. So it's actually moving like this, going to the value of minus pi over two. And as omega goes to plus infinity, it goes like this. So this kind of a shape is the negative arc tangent of omega over a. And at a, by the way, um, our tangent of 1 is 45 degrees, or pi over 4, uh, minus pi over 4, of course, because there's a negative factor. And at minus a, the value is pi over 4. It passes through these. So this is the uh, angle or phase diagram of x of j omega. As I say, in many cases, uh, I'm not going to uh, be interested in this. I'm not going to ask such uh, questions, but I, I may ask you to draw uh, or 
comment about uh, the band pass or low pass or high pass behavior, uh, which is more related to this shape, okay, in many of the Fourier transforms. Now, before giving a break, I will do one more example, and after the break, we will continue with other examples. The next example signal is x of t is equal to delta of t. Now, do you remember the Fourier series coefficient of impulse train? It was 1 over capital T. So it was constant. And the Fourier transform of delta t is no big surprise. It will be constant. But let's see it from uh, the formula. x of t is delta of t, uh, e to the minus j omega t dt. Now, delta t is non-zero, only at t is equal to zero, nowhere else. So, whatever it multiplies, delta t times whatever it is, that whatever it is must be evaluated at t is equal to zero or at the position of the uh, impulse. It may be at another location, then t is equal to wherever it is, will be the only thing that multiplies the impulse. So this thing, e to the j omega t, must be evaluated at t is equal to zero. Because all other values of that, e to the minus j omega t, will be multiplied by zeros, and they will not have a, any contribution to the integral. So we have to evaluate at t is equal to zero. And at t is equal to zero, e to the minus j omega t is e to the zero, which is one. So I have integral delta t times one times delta t, or dt, immediately. So uh, this uh, expression that you see is the integral of impulse, which is the area under the impulse. And by definition, the area under the impulse is 1. So x of j omega is 1 if x of t is delta t. Okay, this is the impulse, uh, the Fourier transform of impulse as an example. We will continue with other examples, but right now we, we can give some break. Uh, let's meet at 5 past 3, okay? 15.05. Okay, let's meet at that hour. We will continue from wherever we are left. Until then, 15.05.